I am uh, Johan Roos. I'm uh, the Chief Academic Officer of Halt International Business School, where I'm also a Professor of General Management and Strategy. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uh, strategy um, is your topic? What are you interested in? I'm particularly interested in processes of strategy development. This has always been a topic that has fascinated me, and I've spent quite a lot of time in my early days as, a, as an academic to work sort of more traditional ways of doing strategy and then deviated into trying to change that and sort of innovate ways to do strategy. So if you talk about the processes of, of uh, strategy, what kind of processes uh, can I imagine of processes? What kind of processes? Well, traditionally strategy processes was the planning process, which was more of a, like a clock around the, the year that you did certain things at certain times and people, you know, knew, could really anticipate what it was about, and it was very, you can say, instrumental. It used particular tools, particular techniques, typically particular people, and to do it like a, like a machine. Uh, so that was a process. I was more interested in trying to help, can we do it differently? And this is my interest, and, and, but it's about the process by which people in organization, typical leaderships, are developing strategy or refining their strategy. And strategy for me is typically their view about the future and the choices they want to make for the futures, in typically by prioritizing actions. So how did you change and innovate this strategy process? Well, this brings me into the whole idea of, uh, of um, serious play, and, and, uh, which is something I've worked on many years. And it was the idea that if you change a couple of dimensions of that process, things could really be different. Uh, ultimately, it's about changing the process to change, to let the content change. Um, I can get into it more if you want to. Yes, because if, if I, if or people would hear serious play and strategy, it seems that it doesn't fit together because strategy is just a serious process. It, it changed the organization. Why should people play um, in this? Mm -hmm. uh, it may see that, it, sorry, uh, it, it may appear that play and serious things like strategy are sort of contradictory, but they're not. Th think of a process by which people, for instance, talk about strategy, it doesn't have to be that, but people meet, and there's a lot of meetings going on on workshops and off days and so forth. They meet, and think of it in terms of two constraints. One constraint is their intentions when they walk into the room. And the other constraint is the medium or media of communication. So I'll start with the first and see if we can change those. So typically, in a more traditional setting, you will come in with the intention that this is productive work. I'm using the term productive, but I don't have to because work should, by definition, always be productive. But just to emphasize, productive work. They're not coming in there to have frivolous play. Right? I'm again strengthening the word play in its original meaning. Um, but if you relax that constraint a little bit and say that I, I walk into this room not necessarily for a productive outcome, I hope for one, but it doesn't have to be, then it's no longer work in its traditional sense. Then it's something else. And it's suddenly we've taken it closer to the notion of what is play, which is like, it may or may not be useful in an instrumental way, but it should be fun, and it should have a value in itself, because it may be releasing or speaking to my emotions, it may me make new connections, it may me interact with people in a different way, communicate in a different way. This is, of course, for a game as well. But that, that constraint, so think about that. We relax now the constraints of intentionality to be less work and more playful then suddenly I can do things differently, and you have immediate practical implications. Same thing if I relax the constraint of typical medium or media of communication, which is slides, flip charts, <laughs> post-it notes, pens, two-dimensional, what some artist calls flat land, and you change that into saying, it's now actually you can do something in three dimensions. You can actually do things, not just write, you can build, you can construct. In fact, you can combine, you can recombine, you can deconstruct, deconstruct, and you can do things with your hand using physical material. Not only does that 
changed the process visibly, it also changed it because you use different senses. Suddenly you use more tactile or haptic uh, maneuvers, which means you use different senses, touch and feel, and so forth. So, so think about relaxing those two, two constraints from work towards play and from 2D towards 3D, and et voila, you'll get a very different process, and this is the process I call serious play. This has been published uh, in several papers. Now, this is the, the theoretical part, the scientific part, but as far as I know, you are also in, in practice, and there is this method on Lego series play. So how does that come into play? Yes, so let, let me, let, if I just go back and add to the previous one, so you can cut it the way you want, right? Yeah. So when you change these constraints, the way I just explained, you will see that people will tend to not just be deliberate, you know, in a planning sense, they don't not just be deliberate or you can call it rational and, and uh, serious. <laughs> they tend to be actually bring emotions into it, be much more opening for that surprises, things could happen that they did not anticipate. And that's okay. In a planning sense, it's not okay with surprises, but in a game or in a play, there are a lot of surprises and that's the point. You just have to deal with it. So it becomes also more real time ish rather than I do, then things happen. So things are becoming more sort of improvised, more intuitive, and actually, um, yeah, we can talk more about that. But that's a little bit what happens when you do this. And in addition to the more tactile, haptic sense that you actually can start thinking with your hands. So I that now to your, what you said before, and then I come to the uh, serious play because uh, now you said um, the real time is your real time strategy and to, to, to play around so sometimes people uh, say like um, improvisation is real time creativity mm -hmm. that means that you have to be creative here and now mm -hmm. um, without having like years of, mm -hmm. of creating that mm -hmm. so how can you be able to have a real-time strategy that sounds mm. very complex? Mm. It is really about real-time strategy making, but the notion of real-time strategy is also pretty cool. Because uh, if you look at historically, it used to be that we did long-term planning, 10, 15 years on, you know, Soviet Union did five years plan. <laughs> but increasingly, of course, also 20 years ago, when companies faced the similar kind of challenges as they do now, a lot of unknowns, a lot of new technologies, the planning horizon became very short, and uh, suddenly it was at people's faces. You know, really, you have to plan, but things are changing so fast. So this whole idea that you can say the time scale is going asymptotically towards you, or zero, or here and now, is, I think, an intellectually stimul stimulating one to think about. In practice, it means shorter and shorter time horizons, and it means a whole slew of different contingencies. So it becomes almost contingency planning in absurdum. So uh, that, that is where the notion comes from. It's, it's really about the here and now. And it's actually about being aware of what's going on now, uh, rather than just sit and dream and visualize about the future. And many leaders are very good at that, and they like talking about visions and missions, um, which may or may not be close to illusions and hallucinations. But, but it's, it's a dream thing, you can dream about this. But with the real-time notion, we force people to think about what's going on right now. What is going on here and now that I have to be more attentive about? And there's a lot going on here and now. And more and more is going on here and now. So a lot of people are having trouble coping with the here and now and find a good excuse of talking about the future. That doesn't take away an objective and a purpose and all that, but, but what I'm talking about is practical work. Very interesting because if I, if I look at the word imp improvisation, it's uh, improviso, so visus is vision, vision mm. or hallucination. Mm. Provision means foreseen, mm. and improviso means unforeseen. Yeah. So you have to deal with the unforeseen. Yes. And that's more like a real thing. I, I am very much uh, sympathetic with that view. In, in fact, I've um, done some work which was published with a, a fantastic colleague called uh, Bart Victor, but also Matt Statler. And we did some work on uh, preparedness for the unexpected. It's even a book title, a very, very theoretical book, uh, 20, 2007, on that. But it's the whole idea of how can you prepare for 
these unexpected things. How can you be more ready for change is what I'm working on now. But this, because a plan or a strategy is always for the expected, right? It's like, I expect this, I have a plan for it. But what do you do when the plan doesn't work? And there's a wonderful scene in the Apollo 13 movie with uh, Tom Hanks, it's an old movie now, but where there is this crisis, Houston, we have a problem and all that. And then Gene Hanks, uh, I believe that's his name, he's, he's the flight controller on, on, in Houston. And he's basically saying, he takes this big, thick manual and throwing it into the bin and just saying, all right, guys, let's work on it now. That was the plan. They hit something unexpected. It wasn't in the plan. What do we do now? And there they surely have to, I think you would call it improvise. Improvise. They would have to just play and do things. Very tactile work as well. So, yes, there is a relationship. And there's the, the, the TV movies on uh, MacGyver. Uh, who has a similar thing because he has to improvise immediately in that situation. Mm -hmm. I think in France you call it bricolage. Yes. So you play around with things at hand and, and you, you try to build something and, and try to do whatever it is. That's exactly, and uh, Levi Strauss' work on bricolage is one of, you can say, many intellectual foundations of the notion of series play and also the practical version of it, namely Lego series play, which is, happens to be a product. But that's, that's very much so, the, the bricolage, the very fiddling with it, doing it, creating, doing with what you can do. So they, indeed, they did a bricolage in, in, in Houston as well. Yeah. So, so there, there are fascinating also theoretical aspects with that ha which had a, a practical implication. Now, how, how can you transform that into practice um, for example, uh, Lego series play. How can you use this method and these processes to do so, to, to play around, uh, to explore um, the, the strategies? Well, if you release those two constraints that I said before, it means you just find yourself, you have to motivate people that you can go from more of a work to more, more of a play-like mode for these exercises you're doing. And then you have to go from 2D to 3D and you use some useful 3D stuff. And it happens to be that there are some quite useful 3D stuff out there that I really connect to each other. Um, and Lego is one such material, but of course there's other materials as well. But before you can do this, I think, let, let me go back a little bit and, and elaborate a little bit on what does it take to make this happen? Because it's not just switching these constraints or turning these constraints. I think it's really about, um, uh, uh, two things that drives this, which are, we've heard some of this during the Global Peter Drucker Forum. But one is psychological safety, because it's not okay to play with Lego in many boardrooms, right? So you have to create a, a sort of a zone of safety where people feel that it's okay to behave a little bit differently, do a little bit differently, and not just check the boss all the time, whether it's okay, and believe me, I've done this many times. The, the other one is to motivate people to actually dare, again, it's related, but to motivate people to, why should they do this? And why should they do this differently? Maybe they feel psychologically safe, but not necessarily motivated to go in and do something differently. Because we kind of like traditions, we like the way it's used to be done. So these are two drivers you have to work on before you even get into doing something like uh, Lego series play. So is it enough to just um, put uh, Lego bricks on the, the board table? Or no, it's not, uh, and you ask a rhetorical question, of course, but it is not enough to put bricks on the table because that is not psychologically, that's not creating a psychologically safe environment. It is not motivating everybody, although maybe speaking to them a little bit and they will have recognition or flashbacks or whatever. What you need to do is to create this safer zone and potentially a zone for flow as well which sometimes happen by warming people up. And it's a little bit like you warm up for an athletic, uh, you know, let's say a sprint or run or whatever. You just don't start, you warm up your muscles, your body and everything, you're mentally warmed up. So you have to warm people up. And when you use physical materials as a language, which is one of the original ideas in Lego Series Play, is you have to warm up people to that. You have to warm up people to speak in terms of metaphors, uh, to actually visualize in terms of metaphors, construct metaphors, and be parsimonious in doing that. 
you have to help them create stories, tell stories, do object-mediated communication, that is speaking through an object. You have to set some rules that it's not right or wrong or anything that uh, make people withdraw, that retain the safety of, of this particular approach. And that is a, it's a very important job to do, which is the job of the facilitators. That's why this is not for everybody. It's not for everybody users, but it's not for all facilitators, even if some may think so. They have to be extremely attentive to some of these more softer or human issues. And I've seen cases when they're not. Um, but when they are, it works wonders. It works wonders. And people can really get into a mode of, you can say, a state of mind where they will improvise and intuit almost simultaneously. And that is extraordinary. And this is where you see new things, new perspectives, different perspective of the same thing, new kinds of collaborations, a lot of ahas, a lot of insights, which means they also leave some stuff behind. And that is the essence of the value created in some of these methods. In a more contemporary setting, uh, we did a, a really interesting case study of the, the terrible disaster of 9-11, which was, you can say, the, uh, the, perhaps the mother of all unexpected things. But it turned out, of course, that when they analyzed what happened, they had all the information. And they say it was a failure of imagination. That was the overall conclusion. This was a failure of the imagination. And what did they mean? To put things together, which were in different departments and all that. They couldn't put it together because they hadn't worked that way. And I think there's, a, and, and afterwards, they created a center for catastrophe preparedness to, to say, how do we train people to be more, you know, there's first level response, first responders, you know, the fire brigade and police and all that. That's one added. But how do you train people to be more kind of attuned to what could possibly happen? Because there is a need to be prepared, right? And you could put all your GDP in, in preparedness and still be unprepared. But what do you do? And it turns out that you have to play, you have to play more. You have to play scenarios. You have to play, perhaps some do some serious play. You have to be out there. You have to be engaging people in the front line in very different ways rather than sit and read about it or do it. So this is all intertwined in a sense of doing both intellectual but also embodied experience to learn to be more aware, attuned, and be kind of seeing the signals, seeing the early warning signals, and then be ready to act.